Story number 62 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Queen Bee. Two king's sons once went out in search of adventures and fell into a wild, disorderly way of living, so that they never came home again. The youngest, who was called Simpleton, set out to seek his brothers, but when at length he found them they mocked him for thinking that he with his simplicity could get through the world, when they who could not make their way, and yet they were so much cleverer. They all three traveled away together, and came to an ant hill. The two elder wanted to destroy it to see the little ants creeping about in their terror and carrying their eggs away. But Simpleton said, Leave the creatures in peace. I will not allow you to disturb them. Then they went onwards and came to a lake, on which a great number of ducks were swimming. The two brothers wanted to catch a couple and roast them. But Simpleton would not permit it and said, Leave the creatures in peace. I will not suffer you to kill them. At length they came to a bee's nest in which there was so much honey that it ran out of the trunk of the tree where it was. The two wanted to make a fire beneath the tree and suffocate the bees in order to take away the honey. But Simpleton again stopped them and said, Leave the creatures in peace. I will not allow you to burn them. At length the three brothers arrived at a castle, where stone horses were standing in the stables, and no human being was to be seen. And they went through all the halls until quite at the end they came to a door in which were three locks. In the middle of the door, however, there was a little pane, through which they could see into the room. There they saw a little gray man who was sitting at a table. They called him once, twice, but he did not hear. At last they called him for the third time. When he got up, opened the locks, and came out, he said nothing, however, but conducted them to a handsomely spread table, and when they had eaten and drunk, he took each of them to a bedroom. Next morning the little gray man came to the eldest, beckoned to him, and conducted him to a stone table on which were inscribed three tasks, by the performance of which the castle could be delivered. The first was that in the forest beneath the moss lay the princess's pearls, a thousand in number, which must be picked up, and if by sunset one single pearl was wanting, he who had looked for them would be turned into stone. The eldest went thither and sought the whole day. But when it came to an end he had only found one hundred, and what was written on the table came to pass, and he was changed into stone. The next day the second brother undertook the adventure. It did not, however, fare much better with him than with the eldest. He did not find more than two hundred pearls, and was changed to stone. At last the turn came to Simpleton also, who sought in the moss. It was, however, so hard to find the pearls, and he got on so slowly that he seated himself on a stone and wept. And while he was thus sitting, the king of the ants, whose life he had once saved, came with five thousand ants, and before long the little creatures had got all the pearls together and laid them in a heap. The second task, however, was to fetch out of the lake the key of the king's daughter's bedchamber. When Simpleton came to the lake, the ducks which he had saved swam up to him, dived down, and brought the key out of the water. But the third task was the most difficult. From amongst the three sleeping daughters of the king was the youngest and dearest to be sought out. They, however, resembled each other exactly, and were only to be distinguished by having eaten different sweetmeats before they fell asleep. The eldest a bit of sugar, the second a little syrup, and the youngest a spoonful of honey. Then the queen of the bees, which Simpleton had protected from the fire, came and tasted the lips of all three, and at last she remained sitting on the mouth which had eaten honey and thus the king's son recognized the right princess. Then the enchantment was at an end. Everything was released from sleep, and those who had been turned into stone received once more their natural forms. Simpleton married the youngest and sweetest princess, and after her father's death became king, and his two brothers received the two other sisters. End of story number 62《ストーリー63 of Household Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Three Feathers There was once on a time a king who had three sons, of whom two were clever and wise, but the third did not speak much and was simple and was called the simpleton. When the king had become old and weak and was thinking of his end, he did not know which of his sons should inherit the kingdom after him. Then he said to them, Go forth, and he who brings me the most beautiful carpet shall be king after my death. And that there would be no dispute amongst them, he took them outside his castle, blew three feathers into the air, and said, You shall go as they fly. One feather flew to the east, the other to the west, but the third flew straight up and did not fly far, but soon fell to the ground and now one brother went to the right and the other to the left and they mocked simpleton who was forced to stay where the third feather had fallen he sat down and was sad then all at once he saw that there was a trap door close by the feather he raised it up found some steps and went down them and then he came to another door knocked at it and heard somebody inside calling little green maiden small hopping hither and thither, hopped to the door and quickly saw who was there. The door opened, and he saw a great fat toad sitting, and round about her a crowd of little toads. The fat toad asked what he wanted. He answered, I should like to have the prettiest and finest carpet in the world. Then she called a young one and said, Little green maiden small, hopping hither and thither, Hop quickly and bring me the great box here. The young toad brought the box, and the fat toad opened it, and gave Simpleton a carpet out of it, so beautiful and so fine that on the earth above none could have been woven like it. Then he thanked her and ascended again. The two others had, however, looked on their youngest brother as so stupid that they believed he would find and bring nothing at all. "'Why should we give ourselves a great deal of trouble to search?' said they, and got some coarse handkerchiefs from the first shepherd's wives whom they met, and carried them home to the king. At the same time Simpleton also came back, and brought his beautiful carpet, and when the king saw it he was astonished, and said, "'If justice be done, the kingdom belongs to the youngest.' But the two others let their father have no peace." and said that it was impossible that Simpleton, who in everything lacked understanding, should be king, and entreated him to make a new agreement with them. Then the father said, He who brings me the most beautiful ring shall inherit the kingdom, and led the three brothers out, and blew into the air three feathers which they were to follow. Those of the two eldest again went east and west, and Simpleton's feather flew straight up, and fell down near the door into the earth. Then he went down again to the fat toad, and told her that he wanted the most beautiful ring. She at once ordered her great box to be brought, and gave him a ring out of it, which sparkled with jewels, and was so beautiful that no goldsmith on earth could have been able to make it. The two eldest laughed at Simpleton for going to seek a golden ring. They gave themselves no trouble, but knocked the nails out of an old carriage ring and took it to the king. But when Simpleton produced his golden ring, his father again said, The kingdom belongs to him. The two eldest did not cease from tormenting the king until he made a third condition, and declared that the one who brought the most beautiful woman home should have the kingdom. He again blew three feathers into the air, and they flew as before. Then Simpleton, without more ado, went down to the fat toad and said, I am to take home the most beautiful woman. Oh, answered the toad, the most beautiful woman. She is not at hand at the moment, but still thou shalt have her. She gave him a yellow turnip, which had been hollowed out, to which six mice were harnessed. Then Simpleton said, quite mournfully, What am I to do with that? The toad answered, Just put one of my little toads into it. Then he seized one at random out of the circle, and put her into the yellow coach. But hardly was she seated inside it than she turned into a wonderfully beautiful maiden, and the turnip into a coach, and the six mice into horses. 
so he kissed her and drove off quickly with the horses and took her to the king his brothers came afterwards they had given themselves no trouble at all to seek beautiful girls but had brought with them the first peasant women they chanced to meet when the king saw them he said after my death the kingdom belongs to my youngest son but the two eldest deafened the king's ears afresh with their clamor we cannot consent to simpleton's being king and demanded that the one whose wife could leap through a ring which hung in the center of the hall should have the preference they thought the peasant women can do that easily they are strong enough but the delicate maiden will jump herself to death the aged king agreed likewise to this then the two peasant women jumped and jumped through the ring but were so stout that they fell and their coarse arms and legs broke in two and then the pretty maiden whom simpleton had brought with him sprang and sprang through as lightly as a deer and all opposition had to cease so he received the crown and has ruled wisely for a length of time end of story sixty three Story sixty four of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Golden Goose. There was a man who had three sons, the youngest of whom was called Dumbling, and was despised, mocked and put down on every occasion. It happened that the eldest wanted to go into the forest to hew wood, and before he went his mother gave him a beautiful sweet cake and a bottle of wine, in order that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst. When he entered the forest, there met him a little grey-haired old man, who bade him good day, and said, Do give me a piece of cake out of your pocket, and let me have a draught of your wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. But the prudent youth answered, If I give you my cake and wine, I shall have none for myself. Be off with you. And he left the little man standing and went on. But when he began to hew down a tree, it was not long before he made a false stroke, and the axe cut him in the arm, so that he had to go home and have it bound up. And this was the little grey man's doing. After this the second son went into the forest, and his mother gave him, like the eldest, a cake and a bottle of wine. The little old grey man met him likewise, and asked him for a piece of cake and a drink of wine. But the second son, too, said with much reason, What I give you will be taken away from myself. Be off. And he left the little man standing and went on. His punishment, however, was not delayed. When he had made a few strokes at the tree, he struck himself in the leg, so that he had to be carried home. Then Dumbling said, Father, do let me go and cut wood. The father answered, Your brothers have hurt themselves with it. Leave it alone. You do not understand anything about it. But Dumbling begged so long, that at last he said, Just go then. You will get wiser by hurting yourself. His mother gave him a cake made with water and baked in the cinders, and with a bottle of sour beer. When he came to the forest, the little old great man met him likewise and greeted him, said, Give me a piece of your cake and a drink out of your bottle. I am so hungry and thirsty. Dumbling answered, I have only cinder cake and sour beer. If that pleases you, we will sit down and eat. So they sat down, and when Dumbling pulled out his cinder cake, it was a fine sweet cake, and the sour beer had become good wine. So they ate and drank, and after that the little man said, Since you have a good heart, and are willing to divide what you have, I will give you good luck. There stands an old tree. Cut it down, and you will find something at the roots. Then the little man took leave of him. Dumbling went and cut down the tree, and when it fell there was a goose sitting in the roots, with feathers of pure gold. He lifted her up, and taking her with him, went to an inn where he thought he would stay the night. 
Now the host had three daughters, who saw the goose and were curious to know what such a wonderful bird might be, and would have liked to have one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought, I shall soon find an opportunity of pulling out a feather, and as soon as Dumbling had gone out, she seized the goose by the wing, but her finger had remained sticking fast to it. The second came soon afterwards, thinking only of how she might get a feather for herself, and she had scarcely touched her sister than she was held fast. At last the third also came, with a like intent, and the others screamed out, Keep away, for goodness sake, keep away! But she did not understand why she was to keep away. The others are there, she thought. I may as well be there too, and ran to them. But as soon as she had touched her sister, she remained sticking fast to her, so they had to spend the night with the goose. The next morning, Dumbling took the goose under his arm and set out, without troubling himself about the three girls who were hanging on to it. They were obliged to run after him continually, now left, now right, just as he was inclined to go. In the middle of the fields, the parson met them, and when he saw the procession, he said, For shame, you good-for-nothing girls! Why are you running across the fields after this young man? Is that seemly? At the same time, he seized the youngest by the hand in order to pull her away. But as soon as he touched her, he likewise stuck fast, and was himself obliged to run behind. Before long the sexton came and saw his master, the parson, running behind three girls. He was astonished at this, and called out, Hi, your reverence, whither away so quickly? Do not forget that we have a christening today. And, running after him, he took him by the sleeve, but was also held fast to it. Whilst the five were trotting, thus one behind the other, Two laborers came with their hoes from the fields. The parson called out to them and begged that they would set him and the sexton free. But they had scarcely touched the sexton when they were held fast, and now there were seven of them running behind Dumbling and the goose. Soon afterwards he came to a city where a king ruled who had a daughter who was so serious that no one could make her laugh. So he had put forth a decree that whosoever should be able to make her laugh should marry her. When Dumbling heard this, he went with his goose and all her train before the king's daughter. As soon as she saw the seven people running on and on, one behind the other, she began to laugh quite loudly, and as if she would never leave off. Thereupon Dumbling asked to have her for his wife, and the wedding was celebrated. After the king's death, Dumbling inherited the kingdom and lived a long time contentedly with his wife. End of story 64。Story 65 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonja. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Allerlei Rau. There was once on a time a king who had a wife with golden hair, and she was so beautiful that her equal was not to be found on earth. It came to pass that she lay ill, and as she felt that she must soon die, she called the king and said, if thou wishest to marry again after my death take no one who is not quite as beautiful as i am and who has not just such golden hair as i have this thou must promise me and after the king had promised this she closed her eyes and died for a long time the king could not be comforted and had no thought of taking another wife at length his counsellors said there is no help for it the king must marry again, that we may have a queen. And now messengers were sent about far and wide to seek a bride who equalled the late queen in beauty. In the whole world, however, none was to be found, 
and even if one had been found still there would have been no one who had such golden hair so the messengers came home as they went now the king had a daughter who was just as beautiful as her dead mother and had the same golden hair when she was grown up the king looked at her one day and saw that in every respect she was like his late wife and suddenly felt a violent love for her then he spake to his counsellors i will marry my daughter for she is the counterpart of my late wife otherwise i can find no bride who resembles her when the counsellors heard that they were shocked and said god has forbidden a father to marry his daughter no good can come from such a crime and the kingdom will be involved in the ruin the daughter was still more shocked when she became aware of her father's resolution but hoped to turn him from his design then she said to him before i fulfil your wish i must have three dresses one as golden as the sun one as silvery as the moon and one as bright as the stars besides this i wish for a mantle of a thousand different kinds of fur and hair joined together and one of every kind of animal in your kingdom must give a piece of his skin for it but she thought to get that will be quite impossible and thus i shall divert my father from his wicked intentions the king however did not give up and the cleverest maidens in his kingdom had to weave the three dresses one as golden as the sun one as silvery as the moon and one as bright as the stars and his huntsmen had to catch one of every kind of animal in the whole of his kingdom and take from it a piece of its skin and out of these was made a mantle of a thousand different kinds of fur at length when all was ready the king caused the mantle to be brought spread it out before her and said the wedding shall be to-morrow when therefore the king's daughter saw that there was no longer any hope of turning her father's heart she resolved to run away from him in the night whilst every one was asleep she got up and took three different things from her treasures a golden ring a golden spinning wheel and a golden reel the three dresses of the sun moon and stars she put into a nutshell put on her mantle of all kinds of fur and blackened her face and hands with soot then she commanded herself to god and went away and walked the whole night until she reached the great forest and as she was tired she got into a hollow tree and fell asleep the sun rose and she slept on and she was still sleeping when it was full day then it so happened that the king to whom this forest belonged was hunting in it when his dogs came to the tree they sniffed and ran barking round about it the king said to the huntsman just see what kind of wild beast has hidden itself in there the huntsman obeyed his order and when they came back they said a wondrous beast is lying in the hollow tree we have never before seen one like it its skin is fur of a thousand different kinds but it is lying asleep said the king see if you can catch it alive and then fasten it to the carriage and we will take it with us when the huntsman laid hold of the maiden she awoke full of terror and cried to them i am a poor child deserted by father and mother have pity on me and take me with you then they said Alalairau, thou wilt be useful in the kitchen come with us and thou canst sweep up the ashes so they put her in the carriage and took her home to the royal palace there they pointed out to her a closet under the stairs where no daylight entered and said hairy animal there canst thou live and sleep then she was sent into the kitchen and there she carried wood and water swept the hearth plucked the fowls picked the vegetables raked the ashes and did all the dirty work alalairau lived there for a long time in great wretchedness alas fair princess what is to become of thee now it happened however that one day a feast was held in the palace and she said to the cook may i go upstairs for a while and look on i will place myself outside the door the cook answered yes go but you must be back here in half an hour to sweep the hearth then she took her oil lamp went into her den put off her fur dress 
and washed the soot of her face and hands so that her full beauty once more came to light and she opened the nut and took out her dress which shone like the sun and when she had done that she went up to the festival and every one made way for her for no one knew her and thought no otherwise than that she was a king's daughter the king came to meet her gave his hand to her and danced with her and thought in his heart my eyes have never yet seen any one so beautiful when the dance was over she curtsied and when the king looked round again she had vanished and none knew whither the guards who stood outside the palace were called and questioned but no one had seen her she had however run to her little den had quickly taken off her dress made her face and hands black again put on the fur mantle and again was a la lairau and now when she went into the kitchen and was about to get to her work and sweep up the ashes the cook said leave that alone till morning and make me the soup for the king i too will go upstairs a while and take a look but let no hairs fall in or in future thou shalt have nothing to eat so the cook went away and alalairau made the soup for the king and made bread soup and the best she could and when it was ready she fetched her golden ring from her little den and put it in the bowl in which the soup was served when the dancing was over the king had his soup brought and ate it and he liked it so much that it seemed to him he had never tasted better but when he came to the bottom of the bowl he saw a golden ring lying and could not conceive how it could have got there then he ordered the cook to appear before him the cook was terrified when he heard the order and said to alalairau thou hast certainly let a hair fall into the soup and if thou hast thou shalt be beaten for it when he came before the king the latter asked who had made the soup the cook replied i made it but the king said that is not true for it was much better than usual and cooked differently he answered i must acknowledge that i did not make it it was made by the rough animal the king said go and bid it come up here when alalairau came the king said who art thou i am a poor girl who no longer has any father or mother he asked further of what use art thou in my palace she answered i am good for nothing but to have boots thrown at my head he continued where didst thou get the ring which was in the soup she answered i know nothing about the ring so the king could learn nothing and had to send her away again after a while there was another festival and then as before alalairau begged the cook for leave to go and look on he answered yes but come back again in half an hour and make the king the bread soup which he so much likes then she ran into her den washed herself quickly and took out of the nut the dress which was as silvery as the moon and put it on then she went up and was like a princess and the king stepped forward to meet her and rejoiced to see her once more and as the dance was just beginning they danced it together but when it was ended she again disappeared so quickly that the king could not observe where she went she however sprang into her den and once more made herself a hairy animal and went into the kitchen to prepare the bread soup when the cook had gone upstairs she fetched a little golden spinning wheel and put it in the bowl so that the soup covered it then it was taken to the king who ate it and liked it as much as before and had the cook brought who this time likewise was forced to confess that alalairau had prepared the soup alalairau again came before the king but she answered that she was good for nothing else but to have boots thrown at her head and that she knew nothing at all about the little golden spinning wheel when for the third time the king held a festival all happened just as it had done before the cook said faith roughskin thou art a witch and always puttest something in the soup which makes it so good that the king likes it better than that which i cook but as she begged so hard he let her go up at the appointed time and now she put on the dress which shone like the stars and thus entered the hall again the king danced with the beautiful maiden and thought that she never yet had been so beautiful and whilst she was dancing he contrived without her noticing it to slip a golden ring on her finger and he had given orders that the dance should last a very long time 
when it was ended he wanted to hold her fast by her hands but she tore herself loose and sprang away so quickly through the crowd that she vanished from his sight she ran as fast as she could into her den beneath the stairs but as she had been too long and had stayed more than half an hour she could not take off her pretty dress but only threw over it her fur mantle and in her haste she did not make herself quite black but one finger remained white then alalairau ran into the kitchen and cooked the bread soup for the king and as the cook was away put her golden reel into it when the king found the reel at the bottom of it he caused alalairau to be summoned and then he espied the white finger and saw the ring which he had put on it during the dance then he grasped her by the hand and held her fast and when she wanted to release herself and run away her mantle of fur opened a little and the star dress shone forth the king clutched the mantle and tore it off then her golden hair shone forth and she stood there in full splendor and could no longer hide herself and when she had washed the soot and ashes from her face she was more beautiful than any one who had ever been seen on earth but the king said thou art my dear bride and we will never more part from each other thereupon the marriage was solemnized and they lived happily until their death end of story sixty five story number sixty six of household tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Hare's Bride. There was once a woman and her daughter who lived in a pretty garden with cabbages, and a little hare came into it and during the winter time ate all the cabbages then says the mother to the daughter go into the garden and chase the hare away the girl says to the little hare shh hare you are still eating up all our cabbages says the hare come maiden and seat yourself on my little hare's tail and come with me into my little hare's hut the girl will not do it next day the hare comes again and eats the cabbages then says the mother to the daughter go into the garden and drive the hare away the girl says to the hare, "'Shh, little hare, you are still eating all the cabbages.' The little hare says, "'Maiden, seat thyself on my little hare's tail, and come with me into my little hare's hut.' The maiden refuses. The third day the hare comes again and eats the cabbages. On this the mother says to the daughter, "'Go into the garden and hunt the hare away.' Says the maiden, "'Shh, little hare, you are still eating all our cabbages.' Says the little hare, come maiden seat thyself on my little hare's tail and come with me into my little hare's hut the girl seats herself on the little hare's tail and then the hare takes her far away to his little hut and says now cook green cabbage and millet seed and i will invite the wedding guests then all the wedding guests assembled who were the wedding guests that i can tell you as another told it to me they were all hares and the crow was there as parson to marry the bride and bridegroom and the fox as clerk, and the altar was under the rainbow. The girl, however, was sad, for she was all alone. The little hare comes and says, Open the doors, open the doors, the wedding guests are merry. The bride says nothing but weeps. The little hare goes away. The little hare comes back and says, Take off the lid, take off the lid, the wedding guests are hungry. The bride again says nothing and weeps. The little hare goes away. The little hare comes back and says, take off the lid take off the lid the wedding guests are waiting then the bride says nothing and the hare goes away but she dresses a straw doll in her clothes and gives her a spoon to stir with and sets her by the pan with the millet seed and goes back to her mother the little hare comes once more and says take off the lid take off the lid and gets up and strikes the doll on the head so that her cap falls off then the little hare sees that it is not his bride and goes away and is sorrowful. End of story number 66. Story 67 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Twelve Huntsmen. There was once a king's son who was betrothed to a maiden whom he loved very much. And when he was sitting beside her and very happy, news came that his father lay sick unto death, and desired to see him once again before his end. Then he said to his betrothed, I must go now and leave thee, I give thee a ring as a remembrance of me. When I am king, I will return and fetch thee. So he rode away, and when he reached his father, the latter was dangerously ill and near his death. He said to him, Dear son, I wish to see thee once again before my end. Promise me to marry as I wish. And he named a certain king's daughter who was to be his wife. The son was in such trouble that he did not think what he was doing and said, Yes, dear father, your will shall be done. And thereupon the king shut his eyes and died. When, therefore, the son had been proclaimed king, and the time of mourning was over, he was forced to keep the promise which he had given his father, and caused the king's daughter to be asked in marriage, and she was promised to him. His first betrothed heard of this, and fretted so much about his faithlessness that she nearly died. Then her father said to her, Dearest child, why art thou so sad? Thou shalt have whatsoever thou wilt. She thought for a moment and said, Dear father, I wish for eleven girls exactly like myself in face, figure, and size. The father said, If it be possible, thy desire shall be fulfilled. And he caused a search to be made in his whole kingdom until eleven young maidens were found who exactly resembled his daughter in face, figure, and size. When they came to the king's daughter, she had twelve suits of huntsmen's clothes made, all alike, and the eleven maidens had to put on the huntsman's clothes, and she herself put on the twelfth suit. Thereupon she took leave of her father and rode away with them, and rode to the court of her former betrothed, whom she loved so dearly. Then she inquired if he required any huntsman, and if he would take the whole of them into his service. The king looked at her, and did not know her, but as they were such handsome fellows, he said, yes, and that he would willingly take them, and now they were the king's twelve huntsmen. The king, however, had a lion, which was a wondrous animal, for he knew all concealed and secret things. It came to pass that one evening he said to the king, Thou thinkest thou hast twelve huntsmen? Yes, said the king, they are twelve huntsmen. The lion continued, Thou art mistaken, they are twelve girls. The king said, That cannot be true. How wilt thou prove that to me? Oh, just let some peas be strewn in thy antechamber, answered the lion, and then thou wilt soon see it. Men have a firm step, and when they walk over the peas none of them stir, but girls trip and skip and drag their feet and the peas roll about. The king was well pleased with the council and caused the peas to be strewn. There was, however, a servant of the king's, who favoured the huntsmen, and when he heard that they were going to be put to this test, he went to them and repeated everything, and said, The lion wants to make the king believe that you are girls. Then the king's daughter thanked him, and said to her maidens, Put on some strength, and step firmly on the peas. So next morning, when the king had the twelve huntsmen called before him, and they came into the antechamber where the peas were lying. They stepped so firmly on them, and had such a strong, sure walk, that not one of the peas either rolled or stirred. Then they went away again, and the king said to the lion, Thou hast lied to me, they walk just like men. The lion said, They have got to know that they were going to be put to the test, and have assumed some strength. Just let twelve spinning wheels be brought into the antechamber some day, and they will go to them and be pleased with them, and that is what no man would do. The king liked the advice, and had the spinning wheels placed in the antechamber. But the servant, who was well disposed to the huntsman, went to them and disclosed the project. Then, when they were alone, the king's daughter said to her eleven girls, Put some constraint on yourselves, and do not look round at the spinning wheels. And next morning, when the king had his twelve huntsmen summoned, 
They went through the antechamber and never once looked at the spinning wheels. Then the king again said to the lion, Thou hast deceived me. They are men, for they have not looked at the spinning wheels. The lion replied, They have learnt that they were going to be put to the test, and have restrained themselves. The king, however, would no longer believe the lion. The twelve huntsmen always followed the king to the chase, and his liking for them continually increased. Now it came to pass that once when they were out hunting, news came that the king's betrothed was approaching. When the true bride heard that, it hurt her so much that her heart was almost broken, and she fell fainting to the ground. The king thought something had happened to his dear huntsman, ran up to him, wanted to help him, and drew his glove off. Then he saw the ring which he had given to his first bride, and when he looked in her face he recognized her. Then his heart was so touched that he kissed her, and when she opened her eyes he said, Thou art mine, and I am thine, and no one in the world can alter that. He sent a messenger to the other bride, and entreated her to return to her own kingdom, for he had a wife already, and a man who had just found an old dish did not require a new one. Thereupon the wedding was celebrated, and the lion was again taken into favor, because, after all, he had told the truth. End of story 67「Story No. 68 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Thief and His Master. Hans wished to put his son to learn a trade. So he went into the church and prayed to our Lord God to know which would be most advantageous for him. Then the clerk got behind the altar and said, Thieving! Thieving! On this Hans goes back to his son and tells him he is to learn thieving, and that the Lord God said so. So he goes with his son to seek a man who is acquainted with thieving. They walk a long time and come into a great forest where stands a little house with an old woman in it. Hans says, do you know of a man who is acquainted with thieving? You can learn that here quite well, says the woman. My son is a master of it. So he speaks with the son and asks if he knows thieving really well. The master thief says, I will teach him well. Come back when a year is over, and then if you recognize your son, I will take no payment at all for teaching him. But if you don't know him, you must give me two hundred thalers. The father goes home again and the son learns witchcraft and thieving thoroughly. When the year is out, the father is full of anxiety to know how he is to contrive to recognize his son. As he is thus going about in his trouble, he meets a little dwarf who says, Man, what ails you, that you are always in such trouble? Oh, says Hans, a year ago I placed my son with a master thief who told me I was to come back when the year was out, and that if I then did not know my son when I saw him, I was to pay two hundred thalers, but if I did know him, I was to pay nothing. And now I am afraid of not knowing him, and can't tell where I am to get the money. Then the dwarf tells him to take a small basket of bread with him, and to stand beneath the chimney. There on the cross beam is a basket, out of which a little bird is peeping, and that is your son. Hans goes thither, and throws a little basket full of black bread in front of the basket, with the bird in it. And the little bird comes out and looks up. Hello, my son, art thou here, says the father. And the son is delighted to see his father, but the master thief says, The devil must have prompted you, or how could you have known your son? Father, let us go, said the youth. Then the father and son set out homeward. On the way a carriage comes driving by. Hereupon the son says to his father, I will change myself into a large greyhound, and then you can earn a great deal of money by me. Then the gentleman calls from the carriage. My man, will you sell your dog? Yes, says the father. How much do you want for it? Thirty thalers. Eh, man, that is a great deal. But as it is such a very fine dog, I will have it. The gentleman takes it into his carriage, and when they have driven a little farther, the dog springs out of the carriage through the window and goes back to his father and is no longer a greyhound. They go home together. 
Next day there is a fair in the neighboring town, so the youth says to his father, I will now change myself into a beautiful horse, and you could sell me, but when you have sold me you must take off my bridle, or I cannot become a man again. Then the father goes with the horse to the fair, and the master thief comes and buys the horse for a hundred thalers, but the father forgets and does not take off the bridle. So the man goes home with the horse and puts it in the stable. When the maid crosses the threshold, the horse says, Take off my bridle, take off my bridle. Then the maid stands still and says, Why canst thou speak? So she goes and takes the bridle off, and the horse becomes a sparrow and flies out the door, and the wizard becomes a sparrow also and flies after him. Then they come together and cast lots, but the master loses, and betakes himself to the water and is a fish. Then the youth also becomes a fish, and they cast lots again, and the master loses. So the master changes himself into a cock, and the youth becomes a fox, and bites the master's head off, and he died, and has remained dead to this day. End of story number 68「and in it an old woman who was a witch dwelt all alone. In the daytime she changed herself into a cat or a screech owl, but in the evening she took her proper shape again as a human being. She could lure wild beasts and birds to her, and then she killed and boiled and roasted them. If anyone came within one hundred paces of the castle, he was obliged to stand still, and could not stir from the place until she bade him be free. But whenever an innocent maiden came within this circle, she changed her into a bird, and shut her up in a wicker work cage, and carried the cage into a room in the castle. She had about seven thousand cages of rare birds in the castle. Now there was once a maiden who was called Eurinda, who was fairer than all other girls. She and a handsome youth named Euringle had promised to marry each other. They were still in the days of betrothal, and their greatest happiness was being together. One day, in order that they might be able to talk together in quiet, they went for a walk in the forest. "'Take care,' said Euringle, "'that you do not go too near the castle.' It was a beautiful evening. The sun shone brightly between the trunks of the trees into the dark green of the forest, and the turtle doves sang mournfully upon the young boughs of the birch trees. Eurinda wept now and then. She sat down in the sunshine and was sorrowful. Euringle was sorrowful too. They were as sad as if they were about to die. Then they looked around them and were quite at a loss, for they did not know by which way they should go home. The sun was still half above the mountain and half set. Euringle looked through the bushes and saw the old walls of the castle close at hand. He was horror-stricken and filled with deadly fear. Eurinda was singing, My little bird with the necklace red sings sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. He sings that the dove must soon be dead, sings sorrow, sorrow, jug, jug, jug. Euringle looked for Eurinda. She was changed into a nightingale and sang jug, jug, jug. A screech owl with glowing eyes flew three times round about her and three times cried, to woo, to woo, to woo. Euringle could not move. He stood there like a stone and could neither weep nor speak nor move hand or foot. The sun had now set. The owl flew into the thicket, and directly afterwards there came out of it a crooked old woman, yellow and lean, with large red eyes and a hooked nose, the point of which reached to her chin. She muttered to herself, caught the nightingale, and took it away in her hand. Euringle could neither speak nor move from the spot. The nightingale was gone. At last the woman came back, and said in a hollow voice, "'Greet thee, Zachiel. If the moon shines on the cage, Zachiel, let him loose at once. Then Euringle was freed. He fell on his knees before the woman and begged that she would give him back his Eurinda, but she said that he should never have her again and went away. 
he called he wept he lamented but all in vain ah what is to become of me Uringel went away and at last came to a strange village there he kept sheep for a long time he often walked round and round the castle but not too near to it at last he dreamt one night that he found a blood-red flower in the middle of which was a beautiful large pearl that he picked the flower and went with it to the castle and that everything he touched with the flower was freed from enchantment he also dreamt that by means of it he recovered his urinda in the morning when he awoke he began to seek over hill and dale if he could find such a flower he sought until the ninth day and then early in the morning he found the blood-red flower in the middle of it there was a large dewdrop as big as the finest pearl day and night he journeyed with his flower to the castle when he was within a hundred paces of it he was not held fast but walked on to the door Uringa was full of joy he touched the door with the flower and it sprang open he walked in through the courtyard and listened for the sound of the birds at last he heard it he went on and found the room from whence it came and there the witch was feeding the birds in the seven thousand cages when she saw Uringa, she was angry very angry and scolded and spat poison and gall at him but she could not come within two paces of him he did not take any notice of her but went and looked at the cages with the birds but there were many hundred nightingales how was he to find his Urinda again just then he saw the old woman quietly take away a cage with a bird in it and go towards the door swiftly he sprang towards her touched the cage with the flower and also the old woman she could now no longer bewitch any one and Urinda was standing there clasping him round the neck and she was as beautiful as ever end of story sixty nine Story 70 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Three Sons of Fortune. A father once called his three sons before him, and he gave to the first a cock, to the second a scythe, and to the third a cat. I am already aged, said he. My death is nigh, and I have wished to take thought for you before my end. Money I have not, and what I now give you seems of little worth, but all depends on your making a sensible use of it. Only seek out a country where such things are still unknown, and your fortune is made. After the father's death, the eldest went away with his cock, but wherever he came the cock was already known. In the towns he saw him from a long distance, sitting upon the steeples and turning round with the wind, and in the villages he heard more than one crowing. No one would show any wonder at the creature, so that it did not look as if he would make his fortune by it. At last, however, it happened that he came to an island where the people knew nothing about cocks, and did not even understand how to divide their time. They certainly knew when it was morning or evening, but at night, if they did not sleep through it, not one of them knew how to find out the time look said he what a proud creature it has a ruby red crown upon its head and wears spurs like a knight it calls you three times during the night at fixed hours and when it calls for the last time the sun soon rises but if it crows by broad daylight then take notice for there will certainly be a change of weather the people were well pleased. For a whole night they did not sleep, and listened with great delight as the cock at two, four and six o'clock, loudly and clearly proclaimed the time. They asked if the creature were for sale, and how much he wanted for it. About as much gold as an ass can carry, answered he. 
a ridiculously small price for such a precious creature. They cried unanimously, and willingly gave him what he asked. When he came home with his wealth, his brothers were astonished, and the second one said, Well, I will go forth and see whether I cannot get rid of my scythe as profitably. But it did not look as if he would, for laborers met him everywhere, and they had scythes upon their shoulder as well as he. At last, however, he chanced upon an island where the people knew nothing of scythes. When the corn was ripe there, they took cannon out of the fields and shot it down. Now this was rather an uncertain affair. Many shot right over it. Others hit the ears instead of the stems and shot them away, whereby much was lost, and beside all this, it made a terrible noise. So the man set to work and mowed it down so quietly and quickly that the people opened their mouths with astonishment. They agreed to give him what he wanted for the scythe, and he received a horse laden with as much gold as it could carry. And now the third brother wanted to take his cat to the right man. He fared just like the others. So long as he stayed on the mainland, there was nothing to be done. Every place had cats, and there were so many of them that newborn kittens were generally drowned in the ponds. At last he sailed over to an island, and it luckily happened that no cats had ever yet been seen there, and that mice had got the upper hand so much that they danced upon the tables and benches, whether the masters were at home or not. The people complained bitterly at the plague. The king himself in his palace did not know how to secure himself against them. Mice squeaked in every corner, and gnawed whatever they could lay hold of with their teeth. But now the cat began her chase, and soon cleared a couple of rooms, and the people begged the king to buy the wonderful beast for the country. The king willingly gave what was asked, which was a mule laden with gold, and the third brother came home with the greatest treasure of all. The cat made herself merry with the mice in the royal palace, and killed so many that they could not be counted. At last she grew warm with the work and thirsty, so she stood still, lifted up her head and cried, Mew, mew. When they heard this strange cry, the king and all his people were frightened, and in their terror ran all at once out of the palace. Then the king took counsel what was best to be done. At last it was determined to send a herald to the cat, and demand that she should leave the palace, or if not, she was to expect that force would be used against her. The counselor said, Rather we will let ourselves be plagued with the mice, for to that misfortune we are accustomed, than give up our lives to such a monster as this. A noble youth, therefore, was sent to ask the cat whether she would peaceably quit the castle. But the cat, whose thirst had become still greater, merely answered, Mew, mew. The youth understood her to say, Most certainly not, most certainly not, and took this answer to the king. Then said the counselors, She shall yield to force. Cannon were brought out and the palace was soon in flames. When the fire reached the room where the cat was sitting, she sprang safely out of the window. But the besiegers did not leave off until the whole palace was shot down to the ground. End of Story 70 Story 71 of Household Tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. How Six Men Got On in the World. 
There was once a man who understood all kinds of arts. He served in the war and behaved well and bravely. But when the war was over, he received his dismissal and three farthings for his expenses on the way. Stop, said he. I shall not be content with this. If I can only meet with the right people, the king will yet have to give me all the treasure of the country. Then, full of anger, he went into the forest and saw a man standing therein who had plucked up six trees as if they were blades of corn. He said to him, Wilt thou be my servant and go with me? Yes, he answered, but first I will take this little bundle of sticks home to my mother. And he took one of the trees and wrapped it round the five others, lifted the bundle on his back and carried it away. Then he returned and went with his master who said, We too ought to be able to get through the world very well. And when they had walked on for a short while, they found a huntsman who was kneeling and shouldering his gun and was about to fire. The master said to him, Huntsman, what art thou going to shoot? He answered, Two miles from here is a fly sitting on the branch of an oak tree, and I want to shoot its left eye out. Oh, come with me, said the man. If we three are together, we certainly ought to be able to get on in the world. The huntsman was ready and went with him, and they came to seven windmills, whose sails were turning round with great speed and yet no wind was blowing either on the right or the left, and no leaf was stirring. Then said the man, I know not what is driving the windmills, not a breath of air is stirring. And he went onwards with his servants, and when they had walked two miles, they saw a man sitting on a tree, who was shutting one nostril and blowing out of the other. Good gracious, what are you doing up there? He answered, Two miles from here are seven windmills. Look, I am blowing them till they turn round. Oh, come with me, said the man. If we four are together, we shall carry the whole world before us. Then the blower came down and went with him, and after a while they saw a man who was standing on one leg and had taken off the other and laid it beside him. Then the master said, you have arranged things very comfortably to have a rest. I am a runner, he replied, and to stop myself running far too fast, I have taken off one of my legs, for if I run with both, I go quicker than any bird can fly. Oh, go with me, and if we five are together, we shall carry the whole world before us. So he went with them, and it was not long before they met a man who wore a cap, but had put it quite on one ear. Then the master said to him, Gracefully, gracefully, don't stick your cap on one ear. You look just like a tom fool. I must not wear it otherwise, said he, for if I set my hat straight, a terrible frost comes on, and all the birds in the air are frozen and drop dead on the ground. Oh! Come with me, said the master. If we six are together, we can carry the whole world before us. Now the six came to town, where the king had proclaimed that whosoever ran a race with his daughter and won the victory should be her husband, but whosoever lost it must lose his head. Then the man presented himself and said, I will, however, let my servant run for me. The king replied, then his life also must be staked, so that his head and thine are both set on the victory. When that was settled and made secure, the man buckled the other leg on the runner and said to him, Now be nimble and help us to win. It was fixed that one who was first to bring some water from a far distant well was to be the victor. The runner received a pitcher, and the king's daughter won too and they began to run at the same time. But on an instant, when the king's daughter had got a very little way, the people who were looking on could see no more of the runner, and it was just as if the wind had whistled by. In a short time, he reached the well, filled his pitcher with water, and turned back. Halfway home, however, he was overcome with fatigue, 
and set his pitcher down, lay down himself, and fell asleep. He had, however, made a pillow of a horse's skull, which was laying on the ground, in order that he might lie uncomfortably, and soon wake up again. In the meantime, the king's daughter, who could also run very well, quite as well as any ordinary mortal can, had reached the well, and was hurrying back with her pitcher full of water. And when she saw the runner lying there asleep, she was glad and said, My enemy is delivered over into my hands, emptied his pitcher, and ran on. And now all would have been lost, if by good luck the huntsman had not been standing at the top of the castle, and had not seen everything with his sharp eyes. Then said he, the king's daughter shall still not prevail against us. And he loaded his gun and shot so cleverly that he shot the horse's skull away from under the runner's head without hurting him. Then the runner awoke, leapt up, and saw that his pitcher was empty, and that the king's daughter was already far in advance. He did not lose heart, however, but ran back to the well with his pitcher, again drew some water, and was at home again ten minutes before the king's daughter. Behold, said he, I have not bestirred myself till now. It did not deserve to be called running before, but it pained the king, and still more his daughter, that she should be carried off by a common, disbanded soldier like that. So they took counsel with each other how to get rid of him and his companions. Then said the king to her, I have thought of a way. Don't be afraid, they shall not come back again. And he said to them, You shall now make merry together, and eat and drink. And he conducted them to a room which had a floor of iron, and the doors also were of iron, and the windows were guarded with iron bars. There was a table in the room covered with delicious food, and the king said to them, Go in and enjoy yourselves. And when they were inside, he ordered the doors to be shut and bolted. Then he sent for the cook, and commanded him to make a fire under the room until the iron became red-hot. This the cook did, and the six who were sitting at the table began to feel quite warm, and they thought the heat was caused by the food. But as it became still greater, and they wanted to get out, and found that the doors and windows were bolted, they became aware that the king must have an evil intention, and wanted to suffocate them. He shall not succeed, however, said the one with the cap. I will cause a frost to come, before which the fire shall be ashamed, and creep away. Then he put his cap on straight, and immediately there came such a frost, that all heat disappeared, and the food on the dishes began to freeze. When an hour or two had passed by, and the king believed that they had perished in the heat, he had the doors opened to behold them himself. But when the doors were opened, all six were standing there alive and well, and said that they should very much like to get out to warm themselves, for the very food was fast frozen to the dishes with the cold. Then, full of anger, the king went down to the cook, scolded him, and asked why he had not done what he had been ordered to do. But the cook replied, There is heat enough there, just look for yourself. Then the king saw that a fierce fire was burning under the iron room, and perceived that there was no getting the better of the six in this way. Again the king considered how to get rid of his unpleasant guests, and caused their chief to be brought and said, if thou wilt take gold and renounce my daughter, thou shalt have as much as thou wilt. Oh, yes, Lord King, he answered, give me as much as my servant can carry, and I will not ask for your daughter. On this the king was satisfied, and the other continued, In fourteen days I will come and fetch it. Thereupon he summoned together all the tailors in the whole kingdom, and they were to sit for fourteen days and so a sack, and when it was ready, the strong one who could tear up trees had to take it on his back, and go with it to the king. Then said the king, Who can that strong fellow be who is carrying a bundle 
of linen on his back that is as big as a house. And he was alarmed and said, What a lot of gold he can carry. Then he commanded a ton of gold to be brought. It took sixteen of his strongest men to carry it, but the strong one snatched it up in one hand, put it in his sack, and said, Why don't you bring me more at the same time? That hardly covers the bottom. Then, little by little, the king caused all his treasure to be brought thither, and the strong one pushed it into the sack, and still the sack was not half full with it. Bring more, cried he. These few crumbs don't fill it. Then seven thousand carts with gold had to be gathered together in the whole kingdom, and the strong one thrust them and the oxen harnessed to them into his sack. I will examine it no longer, said he, but will just take what comes, so long as the sack is but full. When all that was inside, there was still room for a great deal more. Then he said, I will just make an end of the thing. People do sometimes tie up a sack even when it is not full. So he took it on his back and went away with his comrades. When the king now saw how one single man was carrying away the entire wealth of the country, he became enraged and bade his horsemen mount and pursue the six and ordered them to take the sack away from the strong one. Two regiments speedily overtook the six and called out, You are prisoners. Put down the sack with the gold, or you will be cut to pieces. What say you, cried the blower, that we are prisoners? Rather than that should happen, all of you shall dance about in the air. Then he closed one nostril, and with the other blew on the two regiments. Then they were driven away from each other, and carried into the blue sky over all the mountains, one here, the other there. One sergeant cried for mercy. He had nine wounds, and was a brave fellow who did not deserve ill-treatment. The blower stopped a little, so that he came down without injury. And when the blower said to him, Now go home to thy king, and tell him he had better send some more horsemen, and I will blow them all into the air. When the king was informed of this, he said, Oh, let the rascals go, they have the best of it. Then the six conveyed the riches home, divided it amongst them, and lived in content until their death. End of story 71Story number 72 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Wolf and the Man. Once on a time the fox was talking to the wolf of the strength of man, how no animal could withstand him and how all were obliged to employ cunning in order to preserve themselves from him. Then the wolf answered, If I had but the chance of seeing a man for once, I would set on him notwithstanding. I can help thee to do that, said the fox. Come to me early tomorrow morning, and I will show thee one. The wolf presented himself betimes, and the fox took him out on the road by which the huntsman went daily. First came an old discharged soldier. Is that a man? inquired the wolf. No, answered the fox. That was one. Afterwards came a little boy who was going to school. Is that a man? No, that is going to be one. At length came a hunter with his double-barrel gun at his back, and hanger by his side, said the fox to the wolf, Look, there comes a man. Thou must attack him, but I will take myself off to my hole. The wolf then rushed on the man. When the huntsman saw him, he said, It is a pity that I have not loaded with a bullet aimed and fired his small shot in his face. The wolf pulled a very wry face, but did not let himself be frightened, and attacked him again, on which the huntsman gave him a second barrel. The wolf swallowed his pain, and rushed on the huntsman, but he drew out his bright hanger, and gave him a few cuts with it, right and left, so that bleeding everywhere he ran howling back to the fox. Well, brother wolf, said the fox, hast thou got on with man? Ah, replied the wolf, I never imagined the strength of man to be what it is. 
First he took a stick from his shoulder and blew into it, and then something flew into my face which tickled me terribly. Then he breathed once more into the stick, and it flew into my nose like lightning and hail. When I was quite close, he drew a white rib out of his side, and he beat me so with it that I was all but left lying dead. See what a braggart thou art, said the fox. Thou throwest thy hatchet so far that thou canst not fetch it back again. End of story 72. Story number 73 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Wolf and the Fox. The wolf had the fox with him, and whatsoever the wolf wished, that the fox was compelled to do. For he was the weaker, and he would gladly have been rid of his master. It chanced that once, as they were going through the forest, the wolf said, Red fox, get me something to eat, or else I will eat thee thyself. Then the fox answered, I know a farmyard, where there are two young lambs, if thou art inclined, we will fetch one of them. That suited the wolf, and they went thither, and the fox stole the little lamb, took it to the wolf, and went away. The wolf devoured it, but was not satisfied with one, he wanted the other as well, and went to get it. As, however, he did it so awkwardly, the mother of the little lamb heard him, and began to cry out terribly and to bleat so, that the farmer came running there. They found the wolf, and beat him so mercilessly, that he went to the fox, limping and howling. Thou hast misled me finally, said he. I wanted to fetch the other lamb, and the country folk surprised me, and have beaten me to a jelly. The fox replied, Why art thou such a glutton? Next day they again went into the country, and the greedy wolf once more said, Red fox, get me something to eat, or I will eat thee thyself. Then answered the fox, I know a farmhouse where the wife is baking pancakes. Tonight we will get some of them for ourselves. They went there, and the fox slipped around the house and peeped and sniffed about until he discovered where the dish was, and then drew down six pancakes and carried them to the wolf. There is something for thee to eat, said he to him, and then went his way. The wolf swallowed down the pancakes in an instant, and said, They make one want more, and went thither and tore the whole dish down so that it broke in pieces. This made such a great noise that the woman came out, and when she saw the wolf, she called the people, who hurried there and beat him as long as their sticks would hold together, till with two lame legs and howling loudly he got back to the fox in the forest. How abominably! Thou hast misled me, cried he. The peasants caught me and tanned my skin for me. But the fox replied, Why art thou such a glutton? On the third day, when they were out together, and the wolf could only limp along painfully, he again said, Red fox, get me something to eat, or I will eat thee thyself. The fox answered, I know a man who has been killing, and the salted meat is lying in a barrel in the cellar. We will get that. Said the wolf, I will go when thou dost that thou mayest help me if I am not able to get away. I am willing, said the fox, and showed him the by-paths and the ways by which at length they reached the cellar. There was meat in abundance, and the wolf attacked it instantly, and thought, There is plenty of time before I need leave off. The fox liked it also, but looked about everywhere, and often ran to the hole by which they had come in, and tried if his body was still thin enough to slip through it. The wolf said, Dear fox, Tell me why thou art running here and there so much, and jumping in and out. I must see that no one is coming, replied the crafty fellow. Don't eat too much. Then said the wolf, I shall not leave until the barrel is empty. In the meantime, the farmer who had heard the noise of the fox's jumping came into the cellar. When the fox saw him, he was out of the hole at one bound. The wolf wanted to follow him, but he had made himself so fat with eating that he could no longer get through, but stuck fast. Then came the farmer with a cudgel, and struck him dead. But the fox bounded into the forest, glad to be rid of the old glutton. End of story number 73 Story number 74 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Turner of Huntsville, Texas. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Story number 74. The Fox and His Cousin. The she-wolf brought forth a young one, and invited the fox to be godfather. After all, he is a near relative of ours, said she. He has a good understanding and much talent. He can instruct my little son, and help him forward in the world. The fox, too, appeared quite honest, and said, Worthy Mrs. Gossip, I thank you for the honor which you are doing me. I will, however, conduct myself in such a way that you shall be repaid for it. He enjoyed himself at the feast and made merry. Afterwards he said, Dear Mrs. Gossip, it is our duty to take care of the child. It must have good food that it may be strong. I know a sheepfold, from which we might fetch a nice morsel. The wolf was pleased with the ditty, and she went out with the fox to the farmyard. He pointed out the fold from afar, and said, You will be able to creep in there without being seen, and in the meantime I will look about on the other side to see if I can pick up a chicken. He, however, did not go there, but sat down at the entrance to the forest, stretched his legs, and rested. The she-wolf crept into the stable. A dog was lying there, and it made such a noise that the peasants came running out, caught Gossip Wolf, and poured a strong burning mixture, which had been prepared for washing, over her skin. At last she escaped and dragged herself outside. There lay the fox, who pretended to be full of complaints, and said, Ah, dear Mistress Gossip, how ill I have fared! The peasants have fallen on me, and have broken every limb I have. If you do not want me to lie where I am and perish, you must carry me away. The she-wolf herself was only able to go away slowly, but she was in such concern about the fox that she took him on her back, and slowly carried him perfectly safe and sound to her house. Then the fox cried to her, Farewell, dear Mistress Gossip. May the roasting you have had do you good. He laughed heartily at her and bounded off. End of story number 74story number seventy five of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry turner of huntsville texas household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt story number seventy five the fox and the cat it happened that the cat met the fox in the forest and as she thought to herself, he is clever and full of experience, and much esteemed in the world. She spoke to him in a friendly way. Good day, dear Mr. Fox. How are you? How is all with you? How are you getting through this dear season? The fox, full of all kinds of arrogance, looked at the cat from head to foot, and for a long time did not know whether he would give any answer or not. At last he said, O oh, thou wretched beard-cleaner, thou piebald fool! thou hungry mouse-hunter, what canst thou be thinking of? Dost thou venture to ask how I am getting on? What hast thou learnt? How many arts dost thou understand? I understand but one, replied the cat modestly. What art is that? asked the fox. When the hounds are following me, I can spring into a tree and save myself. Is that all? said the fox. I am a master of a hundred arts, and have into the bargain a sack full of cunning. Thou makest me sorry for thee. Come with me, I will teach thee how people get away from the hounds. Just then came a hunter with four dogs. The cat sprang nimbly up a tree, and sat down on top of it, where the branches and foliage quite concealed her. Open your sack, Mr. Fox, open your sack, cried the cat to him. But the dogs had already seized him, and were holding him fast. Ah, Mr. Fox, cried the cat, you with your hundred arts are left in the lurch. Had you been able to climb like me, you would not have lost your life. End of story number 75 Story 76 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Pink There was once on a time a queen 
to whom God had given no children. Every morning she went into the garden and prayed to God in heaven to bestow on her a son or a daughter. Then an angel from heaven came to her and said, Be at rest, and thou shalt have a son with the power of wishing, so that whatsoever in the world he wishes for, that shall he have. Then she went to the king and told him the joyful tidings, and when the time was come, she gave birth to a son, and the king was filled with gladness. Every morning she went with the child to the garden where the wild beasts were kept and washed herself there in a clear stream. It happened once when the child was a little older that it was lying in her arms and she fell asleep. Then came the old cook, who knew that the child had the power of wishing, and stole it away, and he took a hen and cut it in pieces and dropped some of its blood on the queen's apron and on her dress. Then he carried the child away to a secret place, where a nurse was obliged to suckle it, and he ran to the king and accused the queen of having allowed her child to be taken from her by the wild beasts. When the king saw the blood on her apron, he believed this, fell into such a passion, that he ordered a high tower to be built, on which neither sun nor moon could be seen, and had his wife put into it, and walled up. Here she was to stay for seven years without meat or drink, and die of hunger. But God sent two angels from heaven in the shape of white doves, which flew to her twice a day, and carried her food until the seven years were over. The cook, however, thought to himself, If the child has the power of wishing, and I am here, he might very easily get me into trouble. So he left the palace and went to the boy, who was already big enough to speak, and said to him, Wish for a beautiful palace for thyself with a garden, and all else that pertains to it. Scarcely were the words out of the boy's mouth when everything was there that he had wished for. After a while the cook said to him, It is not well for thee to be so alone. Wish for a pretty girl as a companion. Then the king's son wished for one, and she immediately stood before him, and was more beautiful than any painter could have painted her. The two played together and loved each other with all their hearts, and the old cook went out hunting like a nobleman. The thought, however, occurred to him that the king's son might some day wish to be with his father, and thus bring him into great peril. So he went out and took the maiden aside and said, Tonight, when the boy is asleep, go to his bed and plunge this knife into his heart, and bring me his heart and tongue, and if thou dost not do it, thou shalt lose thy life. Thereupon he went away, and when he returned the next day, she had not done it, and said, Why should I shed the blood of an innocent boy, who has never harmed any one? The cook once more said, If thou dost not do it, it shall cost thee thy own life. When he had gone away, she had a little hind brought to her, and ordered her to be killed, and took her heart and tongue and laid them on a plate. And when she saw the old man coming, she said to the boy, Lie down in the bed and draw the clothes over thee. Then the wicked wretch came in and said, Where are the boy's heart and tongue? The girl reached the plate to him, but the king's son drew off the quilt and said, Thou old sinner, why dost thou want to kill me? Now I will pronounce thy sentence. Thou shalt become a black poodle, and have a gold collar round thy neck, and shalt eat burning coals till the flames burst forth from thy throat. And when he had spoken these words, the old man was changed into a poodle dog, and had a gold collar around his neck, and the cooks were ordered to bring up some live coals, and these he ate until the flames broke forth from his throat. The king's son remained there a short while longer, and he thought of his mother and wondered if she were still alive, and at length he said to the maiden, 
I will go home to my own country. If thou wilt go with me, I will provide for thee. Ah, she replied, the way is so long, and what shall I do in a strange land where I am unknown? As she did not seem quite willing, and as they could not be parted from each other, he wished that she might be changed into a beautiful pink, and he took her with him. Then he went away to his own country, and the poodle had to run after him. He went to the tower in which his mother was confined, and as it was so high, he wished for a ladder, which would reach up to the very top. Then he mounted up and looked inside, and cried, Beloved mother, lady queen, are you still alive, or are you dead? She answered, I have just eaten, and am still satisfied, for she thought that the angels were there. Said he, I am your dear son, whom the wild beasts were said to have torn from your arms, but I am alive still, and will speedily deliver you. Then he descended again, and went to his father, and caused himself to be announced as a strange huntsman, and asked if he could give him a place. The king said yes, if he was skillful, and could get some gain for him, he should come to him. But that deer had never taken up their quarters in any part of the district or country. Then the huntsman promised to procure as much game for him as he could possibly use for the royal table. So he summoned all the huntsmen together, and bade them go out into the forest with him and he went with them and made them form a great circle open at one end where he stationed himself and began to wish two hundred deer and more came running inside the circle at once and the huntsmen shot them then they were all placed on sixty country carts and driven home to the king and for once he was able to deck his table with game after having had none at all for years now the king felt great joy at this, and commanded that his entire household should eat with him the next day, and made a great feast. When they were all assembled together, he said to the huntsman, As thou art so clever, thou shalt sit by me. He replied, Lord King, your majesty must excuse me. I am a poor huntsman. But the king insisted on it, and said, thou shalt sit by me until he did it whilst he was sitting there he thought of his dearest mother and wished that one of the king's principal servants would begin to speak of her and would ask how it was faring with the queen in the tower and if she were still alive or had perished hardly had he formed the wish than the marshal began and said your majesty we live joyously here but how is the queen living in the tower? Is she still alive, or has she died? But the king replied, She let my dear son be torn to pieces by wild beasts. I will not have her named. Then the huntsman arose and said, Gracious Lord Father, she is alive still, and I am her son, and I was not carried away by wild beasts, but by that wretch the old cook, who tore me from her arms when she was asleep, and sprinkled her apron with the blood of a chicken. Thereupon he took the dog with the golden collar and said, That is the wretch, and caused live coals to be brought, and these the dog was compelled to devour before the sight of all until flames burst forth from its throat. On this the huntsman asked the king, if he would like to see the dog in his true shape, and wished him back into the form of the cook, in the which he stood immediately, with his white apron, and his knife by his side. When the king saw him, he fell into a passion, and ordered him to be cast into the deepest dungeon. Then the huntsman spoke further and said, Father, will you see the maiden, who brought me up so tenderly, and who was afterwards to murder me, but did not do it, though her own life depended on it. The king replied, Yes, I would like to see her. The son said, 
Most gracious father, I will show her to you in the form of a beautiful flower. And he thrust his hand into his pocket and brought forth the pink and placed it on the royal table. And it was so beautiful that the king had never seen one equal to it. Then the son said, Now will I show her to you in her true form, and wished that she might become a maiden. And she stood there looking so beautiful that no painter could have made her look more so. And the king sent two waiting maids and two attendants into the tower to fetch the queen and bring her to the royal table. But when she was led in, she ate nothing and said, The gracious and merciful God, who has supported me in the tower, will speedily deliver me. She lived three days more and then died happily, and when she was buried, the two white doves which had brought her food to the tower and were angels of heaven followed her body and seated themselves on her grave. The aged king ordered the cook to be torn in four pieces, but grief consumed the king's own heart, and soon he died. His son married the beautiful maiden whom he had brought with him as a flower in his pocket, and whether they are still alive or not is known to God. End of story 76「Ob Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Clever Grethel. There was once a cook named Grethel who wore shoes with red rosettes, and when she walked out with them on, she turned herself this way and that, and thought, You certainly are a pretty girl. And when she came home, she drank, in her gladness of heart, a draught of wine. And as wine excites a desire to eat, she tasted the best of whatever she was cooking until she was satisfied and said, The cook must know what the food is like. It came to pass that the master one day said to her, Grethel, there is a guest coming this evening. Prepare me two fowls daintily. I will see to it, master, answered Grethel. She killed two fowls, scalded them, plucked them, put them on the spit, and towards evening set them before the fire, that they might roast. The fowls began to turn brown, and were nearly ready. But the guest had not yet arrived. Then Grethel called out to her master, If the guest does not come, I must take the fowls away from the fire. But it will be a sin and a shame if they are not eaten directly, when they are juiciest. The master said, I will run myself and fetch the guest. When the master had turned his back, Grethel laid the spit with the fowls on one side, and thought, Standing so long by the fire there makes one hot and thirsty. Who knows when they will come? Meanwhile, I will run into the cellar and take a drink. She ran down, set a jug, and said, God bless it to thy use, Grethel, and took a good drink, and took yet another hearty draught. Then she went and put the fowls down again to the fire, basted them, and drove the spit merrily around. But as the roast meat smelled so good, Grethel thought, something might be wrong. It ought to be tasted. She touched it with her finger and said, Ah, how good fowls are. It certainly is a sin and a shame that they are not eaten directly. She ran to the window to see if the master was not coming with his guest, but she saw no one, and went back to the fowls and thought. One of the wings is burning. I'd better take it off and eat it. So she cut it off, ate it, and enjoyed it. And when she had done, she thought, The other must go down too, or else Master will observe that something is missing. When the two wings were eaten, she went and looked for her Master, but did not see him. It suddenly occurred to her, Who knows? 
they are perhaps not coming at all, and have turned in somewhere. Then she said, Hello, Grethel, enjoy yourself. One fowl has been cut in two. Take another drink and eat it up entirely. When it is eaten, you will have some peace. Why should God's good gifts be spoilt? So she ran into the cellar again, took an enormous drink, and ate up the one chicken in great glee. When one of the chickens was swallowed down, and still her master did not come, Grethel looked at the other and said, Where one is, the other should be likewise. The two go together. What's right for the one is right for the other. I think if I were to take another draught, it would do me no harm. So she took another hearty drink, and let the second chicken rejoin the first. When she was just in the best of the eating, her master came and cried, Hurry up! Hasty, Grethel! The guest is coming directly after me. Yes, sir, I will soon serve up, answered Grethel. Meantime the master looked to see that the table was properly laid, and took the great knife, wherewith he was going to carve the chickens, and sharpened it on the steps. Presently the guest came, and knocked politely and courteously at the house door. Grethel ran and looked to see who was there, and when she saw the guest, she put her finger to her lips and said, Hush, hush, get away as quickly as you can. If my master catches you, it will be the worse for you. He certainly did ask you to supper, but his intention is to cut off your two ears. Just listen how he is sharpening the knife for it. The guest heard the sharpening and hurried down the steps again as fast as he could. Grethel was not idle. She ran screaming to her master and cried, You have invited a fine guest. Eh? Why, Grethel? What do you mean by that? Yes, said she. He has taken the chickens which I was just going to serve up off the dish and has run away with them. That's a nice trick, said her master, and lamented the fine chickens. If he had but left me one, so that something remained for me to eat. He called to him to stop, but the guest pretended not to hear. Then he ran after him with the knife, still in his hand, crying, Just one, just one, meaning that the guest should leave him just one chicken, and not take both. The guest, however, thought no otherwise than that he was to give up one of his ears, and ran as fast as if fire were burning under him, in order to take them both home with him. End of story 77Story 7 to 8 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Old Man and His Grandson. There was once a very old man, whose eyes had become dim, his ears dull of hearing, his knees trembled, and when he sat at table he could hardly hold a spoon, and split the broth upon the tablecloth, or let it run out of his mouth. His son and his son's wife were disgusted at this, so the old grandfather at last had to sit in the corner behind the stove and they gave him his food in an earthenware bowl, and not even enough of it. And he used to look towards the table with his eyes full of tears. Once, too, his trembling hands could not hold the bowl, and it fell to the ground and broke. The young wife scolded him, but he said nothing and only sighed. Then they bought him a wooden bowl for a few halfpence out of which he had to eat. They were once sitting thus when the little grandson of four years old began to gather together some bits of wood upon the ground. What are you doing there? asked the father. I'm making a little trough, 
answered the child, for father and mother to eat out of when I'm big. The man and his wife looked at each other for a while and presently began to cry. Then they took the old grandfather to the table and henceforth always let him eat with them and likewise said nothing if he did spill a little of anything. End of story 78story 79 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the water nix a little brother and sister were once playing by a well and while they were there, thus playing, they both fell in. A water nix lived down below who said, Now I've got you, now you shall work hard for me, and carried them off with her. She gave the girl dirty tangled flax to spin, and she had to fetch water in a bucket with a hole in it. And the boy had to hew down a tree with a blunt axe, and they got nothing to eat but dumplings as hard as stones. Then at last the children became so impatient that they waited until one Sunday, when the Nix was at church, and ran away. But when church was over, the Nix saw that the birds had flown, and followed them with great strides. The children saw her from afar, and the girl threw a brush behind her, which formed an immense hill of bristles, with thousands and thousands of spikes, over which the Nix was forced to scramble with great difficulty. At last, however, she got over. When the children saw this, the boy threw behind him a comb, which made a great hill of combs, with a thousand times a thousand teeth. But the nix managed to keep herself steady on them, and at last crossed over that. Then the girl threw behind her a looking-glass, which formed a hill of mirrors, and was so slippery that it was impossible for the nix to cross it. Then she thought, I will go home quickly and fetch my axe and cut the hill of glass in half. Long before she returned, however, and had hewn through the glass, the children had escaped to a great distance, and the water nix was obliged to betake herself to her well again. End of 79 Story 80 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Death of of the little hen once upon a time the little hen went with the little cock to the nut hill and they agreed together that whichsoever of them found a kernel of a nut should share it with the other then the hen found a large large nut but said nothing about it intending to eat the kernel herself the kernel however was so large that she could not swallow it and it remained sticking in her throat, so that she was alarmed, lest she should be choked. Then she cried, Cock, I entreat thee to run as fast as thou canst, and fetch me some water, or I shall choke. The little cock did run as fast as he could to the spring, and said, Stream, thou art to give me some water. The little hen is lying on the nut hill, and she has swallowed a large nut and is choking the well answered first run to the bride and get her to give thee some red silk the little cock ran to the bride and said bride you are to give me some red silk i want to give red silk to the well the well is to give me some water i am to take the water to the little hen who was lying on the nut hill and has swallowed a great nut kernel and is choking with it the bride answered, 
first run and bring me my little wreath which is hanging to a willow so the little cock ran to the willow and drew the wreath from the branch and took it to the bride the bride gave him some water for it then the little cock took the water to the hen but when he got there the hen had choked in the meantime and lay there dead and motionless then the cock was so distressed that he cried aloud and every animal came to lament the little hen and six mice built a large carriage to carry her to her grave and when the carriage was ready they harnessed themselves to it and the cock drove on the way however they met the fox who said where art thou going little cock i am going to bury my little hen oh may i drive with thee yes but seat thyself at the back of the carriage for in the front my little horses cannot drag thee then the fox seated himself at the back and after that the wolf the bear the stag the lion and all the beasts of the forest did the same then the procession went onwards and they reached the stream how are we to get over said the little cock a straw was lying by the stream and it said i will lay myself across and you shall drive over me but when the six mice came to the bridge the straw slipped and fell into the water and the six mice all fell in and were drowned then they were again in difficulty and a coal came and said i am large enough i will lay myself across and you shall drive over me so the coal also laid itself across the water but unhappily just touched it on which the coal hissed was extinguished and died when a stone saw that it took pity on the little cock wished to help him and laid itself over the water then the cock drew the carriage himself but when he got it over and reached the other shore with the dead hen and was about to draw over the others who were sitting behind as well there were too many of them the carriage ran back and they all fell into the water together and were drowned then the little cock was left alone with the dead hen and dug a grave for her and laid her in it and made a mound above it on which he sat down and fretted until he died too and then every one was dead end of story eighty